All right, episode 33 of the Lucas Grandsire podcast. Like I always say, super, super creative name, super creative guy, all that good stuff. I'm very excited about today's guest. It is the great Mike Estime. What's going on, sir? How are you? Lucas, good, man. Good. Thank you for having me on, brother. I appreciate you coming on. It's weird to me because I'm used to seeing you on TV and stuff like that. Now you're here on uh, on my screen. It's a, it's a very strange yeah. sight for me. Yeah, me too. I mean, not like, I just finished telling you before we got on, not for me because uh, this last past year I've been on Zooms and I've had enough of Zoom. I'm Zoomed out, to tell you the truth. But uh, but it's been cool, man. It's uh, just another way of, you know, widening the net to talk to folks. So it's cool, man. I'm, 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 I'm loving it. I saw that you were doing Zoom shows at some point. How, how did you like that? Because that's kind of weird, it seems to me, doing stand-up comedy from Zoom, from a computer. How was that for you? I felt like I was doing an OnlyFans page, and it was the only, and it was the worst OnlyFans ever. It was just like this. It was just uh, pixelated, and people were like delayed laughter. And basically, I'd be talking all of a sudden, I'd be, and that's what it'd be. That would just be frozen, and people like it's, they thought I was having a stroke. They didn't know if my Wi-Fi was down. So it was and for and as for a comic, it's very important that we hear the audience. We need to feel that energy. And occasionally, you know, I would have some good Zoom shows where everything just ran smoothly. But then you have one like, you know, you'd be doing something and then you tell a joke and you hear everybody laughing. And next thing you know, you hear another laugh like I'm doing an international call like there's a delay. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Uh, so I, it was I'm just happy to be in front of people, man. I just I'm so happy. I'm in California now and everything's finally opened up. We're finally able to go to actual clubs and actually perform in front of human beings. Mind you, it's a lot of them with masks, so it sounds like a bunch of Banes from that dark night. <laughs> you know, exactly. So, so it doesn't matter to me. I'm just happy to be out and actually performing. And I don't know if I'm funny or not, but at this point, I don't really care. Like I said, I, I have uh, I've highly taken it taken it for granted, and I'm not gonna do that again. So uh, how is it for you doing all this stuff? Like, are you getting tested a million times for everything? Like, do you have to go through safety briefs before everything? Like, is that still kind of going on? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. A lot of time. Not for the stand-up clubs. I guess the clubs don't give a shit. Like, uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, you know, just make them laugh. But if you're going on set, like uh, like the set that I did on uh, the show that I did with Netflix, oh, they test you, man. I mean, they put it in every hole or orifice that they can think of just to make sure and sometimes I like it. I mean, to tell you the truth, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into that right now. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, man, they just want to make sure because you don't want to be that one dude that fucks it up for everybody. You know, it's like that one dude. You know, you have a party, and then that run drunk friend, he just fucks it up. Be like, thanks, thanks a lot, buddy. Now, now the cops are here. Now we all gotta leave because your dumbass can't keep together. So they just want to make sure it's a, on a little higher level because. These are people's livelihoods. Uh, we're giving people jobs back. Everybody's working. They're doing what they like to do. And you want to make sure you're just not selfish. So they just want to make sure that everything runs smoothly because there's a lot of jobs and opportunity at stake here. And also, at the end of the day, you want to entertain folks. And as we all saw when, you know, it hit, you know, Netflix was my, my uh, support animal. Pretty much, you know, it was like everything was Netflix or Amazon or whatever else, Pornhub, anything I could get my good hands on really much. Thank you, Pornhub, by the way, for making it free for that year. I I appreciate that. Uh, my forearms and it never look better. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's it's all good, man. It's uh, it, it was uh, it, it is uh, daunting. But like I said, I'm not going to take it for granted because I know the alternative, which is to stay home and. Uh, that's not, I don't want to do that again. So when everything shuts down, like there's no more clubs and things like that, what are you thinking of aside from the Pornhub and all that good stuff? What are you thinking about <laughs> what, what you have to do next? Like a lot of guys started podcasts. Some are good. Some are, you know, they do podcasts. Like what, what are you thinking about what you need to do during that time? You know, especially to stay relevant too. Yeah. Uh, Lucas, I like the political correct views. Like some are, you know, they start podcasts. You didn't say some are shitty, but some are shitty. Exactly. You know, really, you say, I like that, man. You're like, I got to look out because I might have some of these guys as my guests. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. I got to show them how it's done. But yeah. Exactly. There, there you go. Um, yeah, I had done a lot of writing. I was doing some writing with my friend, um, the Zoom shows, of course. And also I did do a podcast, which was shitty because uh, – <laughs> I mean, on all honesty, I mean, we had a good content, 
It's just that uh, we didn't have a, uh, I, the, the, when I say good content, I had the right partner with me. It's just, as you know, a podcast, a podcast, which is probably why I fucked up because I said podcast instead of cast. Uh, but it, it takes a while to get a rhythm going and you have to have the right editor and producer. There's a lot that goes beyond just getting in front of a camera and just talking and getting the right guests. And also you have to make sure that you have a loyal audience. And also if you have a partner, you have to make sure that the partner, number one, is always there. You always want to make sure that they're uh, reliable. And number two, that they know how to work a computer, which my partner clearly did not know. He was fucking around. He's like, all right, I think we all right. We all right, Mike? Are we all right? But back away, dude. This is, I felt like I was having a damn Zoom session with my mom. So I was like, come on, man. So it was funny, and we made we made light of that, and we started getting a rhythm. rhythm. But um, unfortunately, we weren't able to keep it going. So I'm going to start another one with another friend of mine who actually has done podcasts, Adam Hunter. Really, oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, really great comedian, real cool comedian. So we're gonna start something ourselves. Um, you know, we're both, you know, now you know have kids and have significant others. So, and we're kind of almost famous so we're like in the middle which is what the show is called the middle so we just are going to be offering our opinions which no one really gives a shit but you know we can make it funny and hopefully people will uh tune in and enjoy so that's one thing that the the, the pandemic and during this time has caused me to do which is of course self-reflection and to be a little more creative and not just saying okay i'm just a stand-up or i'm just an actor you have to start you know, diversifying that portfolio. Are you surprised to see how much success certain comedians have with their podcasts? Like take the most extreme example, right? Like Joe Rogan, they say he's got the number one podcast and you know, the big thing is a comedian and all that stuff. Like, are you surprised seeing like how much success people are having? Well, not really. Like uh, with the example of Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan's always been a personable guy and, and he has, he already had his niche because he was doing UFC and he was a martial arts fighter and he's funny. Um, and he, and when you have those, and, and he had, he knew the right people and he surrounded himself with the right team. And he, when you see his, when you see how he started off, which was like, I think it was like in his house or in a basement or some shit. It was, it was some, it was like with a ham radio and there was like crackling in the background, but it was, it, it was, you could see, uh, the, the fruits and the seeds being planted. So. I could see that happening. Others, you like, nah, man, give it up. It's almost like when you watch. Yeah, others, you like, dude, I, look, man, I love you. Uh, now, do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? Or you want to hear the truth, so you just kind of just let them ha- let them know. But comics are, especially stand-ups, and I le- let people know this. We're very deep thinkers, which is probably why a lot of us have drug problems and relationship problems. You know, we we think a lot, and a lot of times it comes out of humor, books, acting whatever and podcasts now so i it's not a surprising to me now there are some people where i thought okay this person has the fucking you know personality of grass where it just sits there and i don't know how they're doing it but they make it work so i don't put nothing past anybody um but you know god bless him you know joe rogan he did his thing i mean he has a freaking three and a half hour of podcasting which uh i mean i barely can you know, sit through an hour, half of movies sometimes. I'm like, I need a break. So I got to do what I got to do. But uh, yeah, man, it's 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 good to see folks doing their thing. It's good to, as my daughter is right now, making a lot of noise. Hold on, Lucas. Let me, let me get this done. Get out of here. Hey, man. Come here, girl. Hey, you want to go outside? Hey. All right. I think she's gonna whoop somebody's ass right now. I don't know what's going on. It's like, <laughs> there yeah, we go. here we go. She's good now. We good. But uh, yeah, man. No, but podcasts. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tricky business, man. And I'm still learning it myself. You know, which is why you know, one of the rules, which I'm sure you've looked into too, is like, okay, do other people's podcasts so you can see how it's done and get an idea. So that's one thing you always want to do. You just want to keep learning. Even it doesn't matter how long you've been in the business, you're always still learning. 
So when you guys say you're going to do a podcast together, is it going to be kind of like this where it's online or are you guys going to meet up in someone's garage with the microphones attached to the table? Like what's kind of, has it gone that far in sort of your- Oh room? yeah, we, we try, I tried this this setup and that shit didn't work. Like I told you, dude, I mean, yeah. someone's, uh, they have a phone, so they're like this. So they, it looks like a police blotter. I can't see their eyes or they have it reversed or they're, they're oh, I'm sorry. Then I'm talking and they forget to charge their you know laptop and the battery fall. So I was like, no, fuck, we're going to be in person. So there's no fuck ups. We're going to make sure that we're face to face or six feet apart, whatever makes you comfortable and do our thing because I need human interaction, man. I, I really do, dude. It's just at this point, like I said, I'm not taking that shit for granted. I'm just like, I just need to feel the energy of the people and all oh, my boys so I can say, oh, so we can start riffing like a good jazz you know, musician, you know, you need to be in the room so you could get those riffs going. So uh, you said you guys for your podcast, like you're almost famous. What does that mean for you when you go out in the street? Like, I assume you don't have mobs of people, but I'm sure you've got people yelling risky at you when they see you, yeah, right? Like there's got, you have to have some kind of recognition. Yeah, man. You know, uh, when I'm, you know, in Rouse, you know, trying to take out some mangoes or something like that, you know, uh, we, that's our local supermarket here in Los Angeles, you know, local supermarket, some, uh, you know, some, uh, when I'm running, which is not really cool because I love running and exercising. So, you know, I'm in mid set and I'm like on the bench press, like risk him. Like, yeah, man, can you spot a brother? Cause I'm fucking losing it. I'm about to die, you know? I'm like, yeah. So it's, it's a lot of people said um, when they were like, oh, I just want to give it up. I think I heard not Carl, not um, Alfonso Rivera, but someone else had said, ah, oh, yeah, that, that role, I wish it just would die already. But I look at it opposite where you've touched people's lives, man. You know, a lot of people say this is like I can relate to this character or I have someone like this in my neighborhood or I grew up with this character. You know, I know what it's like when I see take Eddie Murphy, for example. You know, Eddie Murphy could do he's been doing some shitty movies every now and then. But I grew up with Eddie and he's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. So for me, he's always going to be my. uh you know, my shining star. It doesn't matter for me. So uh, it, it, it's a it's a great privilege, man. It's it's good that you touch people's lives in a way that you never thought you would. And uh, I would do it again, man. And it, and it was even better to work on a set with great people. And that gave me perspective because a lot of them were doing the business. And at that time, I was, you know, somewhat new still. And a lot of them were doing it for like 15, 20, 25 years. And they were on other shows that were hits and they were gone for a while and they brought them back. So they taught me, hey, man, don't don't think this shit happens all the time. You know what I'm saying? This shit, you better enjoy this now. Don't this shit. They say, like, all right, another one happened. Yeah. No, nah, man. The phone will stop ringing eventually. So you better make use of it and enjoy it and and, uh, and appreciate the fans that come up to you and anyone that comes up, comes up to you and remembers you. Because it, it could be the alternative. Because you could be that... The, the, they call it the uh, the clap snap guy. Ah, you're the. Uh, I know you. Yeah. I know you. Were they squinting like you're a fucking eclipse? Ah, I think I know who you are. Uh, but at least they're like risky. They don't know my name, but they're like risky. <laughs> so it's good. it just does not cool when you know if I go to a strip club like hey, it's risky. I'm like hey man, no, I'm not risky. I'm Mike right here. No, I don't want to be risky here. <laughs> exactly. How how important was that role for you in your career, though? Because I believe like you were only supposed to come on once, sell stuff out of your trunk, and before you know it, for four years, we're buying illegal stuff from you. <laughs> like, how, how important was that, you know, for you in your career? It was huge. It was huge because at that point, you know, you go through a point where you're like, "Do I really? Is this really going to pan out for me? Um, is this uh, is this going to work? Because I have a family, you know, to support and." kids. I'm like, man, shit, I can't have my kids looking at me. Daddy, what are you doing? Going to lose out on a job again? And shut your ass up. <laughs> Dad, uh, you know, it's my house. It is my damn house, fool. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? Um, but yeah, it was huge because when I did it, like you said, it was supposed to be just one scene selling out of a trunk. And apparently what I did was good enough for the folks on set. And the director comes up to me and he goes, we're going to be seeing a lot of you. And I thought that was some bullshit. Like, okay, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, all right. I've heard this before. Yeah, don't call me, we'll call you. 
Um, and that spun out to two, three, four more episodes. And they wrote one episode just entirely for me. And that just put me to another level. And that gave me a, a conduit to folks and another avenue for people to introduce who I am. Because like I said, stand-up is my first love. And even though some people might know me from stand up from local clubs, but they've never known me on a national level. And now with this, with everybody's Chris, an international level, a global level, which is amazing. Uh, you know, when I'm getting texts from Brazil or something like that, we love you, but they call me danger. And I'm like, yeah, yeah I don't know, it was like danger. What the hell are you talking about, danger? I thought it was, I'm like, huh? Danger. You're damn like, nah, man, I'm, I'm safe. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm cool. Exactly. Like, no, no, because they don't have a, a word for risky out there, so it's danger. And I guess dubbed in Portuguese. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. I guess I'm danger. So it's kind of got a swag to it. So I was cool with that, man. And um, it was, a, it's, it's a good feeling, man. It, it was a really great feeling to know that my work is being appreciated. And that's all you want. You just want your work and yourself to be, your work to be appreciated and you as an artist to be valued. That's all we need. So do they tell you with a character like that, here's what we're looking for at a risk here? Do they just explain it real quick and you have to figure out who is this guy selling stolen goods or what is it, street entrepreneur? Like how much of that is you creating that character yourself? The latter. How, how much would you can bring? They'll say, they'll give you a little nuggets. And I like it that way, actually. I don't like people to hold my hand and to walk me through it because then the creativity is lost. Then you don't have a chance to play because I love to play and figure things out and because what they may see as funny, I might not see as funny, you know, and I like it more of a, and what I might do, they might see, uh, no, nah, Mike, that's shit. Let's uh, scrap that. Yeah. And so you want to make it a collaborative effort. So you want to bring something to the table. It's like, um, you know, like tennis, you know, they, you know, they hit it to you and you volley back and then maybe you do a slice or an overhand and then the person does a little drop shot and all that. Now I'm getting all technical. I know these tennis players like, what the fuck are you talking about? Exactly. Um, but just, that's just to give you an example of how it should be on set, how it should be in a play, how it should be actually sometimes in stand-up. Sometimes you get a different energy and you have to adapt and evolve because that's one thing you have to be is very pliable and flexible on set. Because if you have a director or a stage man and don't ever just so stringent, no, I want to be this way, I need to be this way, I need to be that you're gonna, he's gonna fucking have a heart. They're gonna have a heart attack, and then you're not going to be able to really see where this character can flow and go because it's a beautiful thing when you let your mind just free and let and and you know legally without shrooms or anything. I'm just saying. I mean, it does help. Don't get me wrong, because it did help during the pandemic. Not that I took it, wink. Right. Uh, but I'm just saying. Allegedly. Uh, yeah. No, exactly. Uh, it does. It does free you, and to. Uh, play like I said and just be an artist there, there is something I have to know specifically from the show from one of the storylines that honestly your character kind of disappointed me it's the, the episode with the dirty magazine where Chris is you know looking to buy it from someone oh, and he, and he gets to risky and I'm thinking like if there's one because the way you played your character you always seem so nice like you're selling me my shirt bag but you're nice about it so I'm like we can count on Risky for it. And you gave him a big speech, man. Like, what happened? Now Risky's going to tell me, like, I can't buy a stolen magazine? Yeah, well, you know what? They got to give Risky some morals. The man is called Risky, okay? <laughs> He's called Risky, okay? Now, that, that doesn't, I mean, I'm, I hope he doesn't do that in the clubs because then some, he's not getting any play. He's not getting any ass from any girl. No. He'd be called Risky, like, mm, mm, Risky, you better get yourself tested. Uh, exactly. Yeah, but, but he did. I mean, if you remember that scene, he did place that bet for that young man for the horses. So he did do that. I mean, so he does, he didn't lose his edge. He <laughs> just know, he just knew what his mama, Rochelle, would say to his ass. Because remember, Rochelle didn't fuck around. <laughs> she, beat she damn near beat me for some food stamps. So what do you think she gonna do when she when I give her boy a damn Playboy magazine? So it's very important to uh, to know that. And I, I and actually I liked when they did that to show that Risky does care about these kids. I mean, it's a neighborhood, it's a community. And there's certain things, it's almost like, think about it like, uh, and I don't, if you've ever been around shady characters and you wanna do the exact shady thing that they do, like, hey man, don't do that shit, all right? You go to school, you become something. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're like, but 
Wait a minute, but you're but you're selling drugs. Yeah, that's me. I ain't had right. no choice. You have exactly. a choice. Put your ass off the street. So and he's like one of those characters where he's already made his choice. He's already made his his bed, uh, and there's no getting out of it. But you still have a life. His life has already been chosen. He's already on that path. But he could do do anything he could do to steer you clear from that path to become better than him. He's willing to do, and a lot of a lot of guys do that. A lot of players do that in the in the hood. You know what I'm saying? So I like that. Just that that was a nice little juxtaposition. But then again, he did place that bet for that young man for the horse. So I don't know how how much Risky does care about the community, but I like that part where you know it shows that Risky does have a heart and has some love for uh, Chris. When you say they wrote the whole episode for you, was that the one where you go to work with Julius? Like we find out you have an actual first name and everything. I was like, are yeah. they gonna talk about it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was the episode. That was a great episode. Ali uh, Leroy, who wrote that episode for me, just to show that you know, okay, we know Risky. Let's get a little bit, just like they do with a lot of characters where they want to, you know, peel those those layers of the onions back, and to show uh, this this is not some dude that just. You know, at the end of time, at the end of the day, you see that he's straight up hustler. That's what he is. Yeah. He's like, I've hustled all my life. I, I can't get a regular job. He's an he's an entrepreneur Negro. That's what we call him. He's not an entrepreneur. Right. He's an entrepreneur Negro. So he likes to work for himself. Now, mind you, he might not be on the up and up, but at least he makes his own hours. He gets his own stuff. Some may work. Some may not. But, hey, it's his. Uh, and Julius tries it. As you know, Julius is a hardworking dude. That's 15 jobs and everything, but Risky's like, that's stupid. You know, I'm not going to do all that. So it, it's just a way of just showing another side of Risky, just like you said with the uh, the Playboy mags with uh, Chris. You know, there's a lot, a lot of dimensions and a lot of layers to him. And then he said, oh, okay, that's how he is. And then once you see it, then people can say, okay, I can accept Risky. That's just Risky being Risky. So. But I always thought it was weird how nice some of those characters are. Because I feel like in real life, Risky would not be that nice. Or even Jerome, like, he took a dollar from you, but he did help Chris get to a party and stuff. So it was weird to me. Like, these guys who in real life scared the shit out of you, but they're actually kind of nice some, somewhere in there on the show. Yeah, man. You, you, I mean, you can't be an asshole the whole show. I'm that guy. Hey, I'm, I'm like, this guy's a dick. I don't want to hang out with this boy. What is wrong with him? So you want to be an asshole. Even, you know, everybody has, it's like life, right? Everybody has a great, a nice person, but we could be a dick every now and then. We could say some shit. We're like, oh, God. That was, and then we'll think later on, that was a dick move. Maybe that's why he kicked me in my chest. Okay, I should have done that. Maybe he, that's why he sideswiped me off the highway. Okay, I, I got that. That's my bad. My bad. E me. I'll take the L on that one. So, I mean, so you want to show, like, I, and that's what I think about everybody H. Chris. You want to show the community that they're in because it is at the end of the day, you're going to have your characters, but I think what they wanted to show and I think what they did show su successfully is that they still all care for each other. You know, when Rochelle or Julius are out, you know, even though Risky, Risky is like, he was like, okay, well, I'm your uncle now. I'm uncle Risky. Cause I'm, I'm not going to give you these playboy mags. I'm not going to fuck you up. Exactly. Cause I, I know what, I'm not going to do this. I know it. Wait for your ass and titties later. Don't worry about it. Just be you. Go to school. Be something because everybody saw something in Chris. Everybody knew something was good to happen. They didn't know what, but they didn't want to be the one that derailed him from his dream. And I think that's what Jer uh, Jerome did too. You know, got him into a party. He's like, hey, man, you're a good kid. I like to help you out. You know, and sure, you may get in trouble later on, but I, I like you. I like your spunk. So I think at the end of the day, you know, they was big brothers and little sisters aside from the immediate family that Chris, you know, had at home with Julius and, and his and his little brother and and his and his tattletale ass sister. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, when they tell you get a whole episode for you, are you sitting there like, I have to bring it? Like, this is the one that's going to bring me the Oscar? Like, what's your mentality? Because <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of guys would have overacted the whole thing. Like, you know, maybe I can do this every episode. Like, what are you thinking when they tell you that? I'm just, I'm just, for, I'm just grateful that they took the time out. And they, again, it goes back to uh, being valued and being respected for your craft. Because they didn't have to do that. They could have been like, oh, no, no, you're good. No, we'll, we'll just have you here and there. Just sell, you know, just sell another Gritsky shirt or, a, another, and, you know, or a cock ring or something for, you know, 
Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner, you know, when he mm-hmm. were at the uh, when he were at the Olympics or something. You know what I'm saying? It could have been that, but they 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 believed in me and they said, Mike, we think you're talented enough to have your own episode and to roll with Julius and to roll with Terry. And that was great. And I I I'm appreciative of, of that, man. It's really, it was really t- telling to show that the work that I've been putting in was recognized and appreciated. So I'm really appreciative of that. Did, did you realize yeah. at the time some of the big names that were on the show? Like, obviously, like, there, there's, like, Tatina Arnold. We, we already knew she was big, but Terry Crews is on the come up. There's a ton of extras looking back where you're like, wait a minute, that's somebody now. Like, Whoopi Goldberg was there. Like, did oh. you realize, like, the amount of, like... I had no clue, bro. Yeah. I had no clue until I'm walking past going to get my food. I'm like, that's motherfucker with Quirk. That's Whoopi Goldberg. Or, you know, or that's Jack A. Harry, or that's uh, Ernest Thompson, or that, oh, that's Todd Bridges. Or that's, I mean, it was just a who's who of back in the day when I was growing up and watching these folks. You know, I'm like, oh my God, different stroke. When the world don't move. I'm singing theme songs and, and it was just really, and those are, it was really great. And those are the people that I spoke to the most. Because I was like, how was it back then? And what do you do? And they would give me great stories, especially Todd Bridges. He's just, he has stories for days. And um, he's just deep as hell. And he was just awesome. And uh, he was just, it was just, they were really giving. And they were really appreciative, appreciative, appreciative. Yeah, I'll get the word right. Appreciative to be there. And that's what made me say, okay. They're at a level where, you know, they don't, they could be an asshole or they could be really standoffish, but they're giving of who they are. They're appreciative of where they, of where they've come from. And they're appreciative that they, people have remembered them to bring them back and put them in the public eye. And Whoopi Goldberg, I mean, she's still doing the thing. She didn't have to do that, but because she had respect for the show and respect for Chris and all of that, hey, she came back and did it. So that was great. So with a lot of comics, stand-up comedians, like a lot of the people they talk about, well, the two main ones I feel like everyone talks about is obviously Eddie Murphy and Chris Rock as well. Like that's a big one. You hear a lot of people talk about the legend of Chris Rock. Did you get a chance to really speak with him through doing the show or is that someone kind of more behind the scenes? Oh, he's more behind the scenes. And Chris is, you know, Chris thinks he's like Chris Rock on stage. Oh man, can you understand, mother? No, that was like Chris Rock, Bernie Mac. I don't know. That was the worst. Yeah, I was thinking Bernie Mac. But yeah, yeah, I was thinking uh, Bernie Mac. I was like, oh, motherfucker. Yeah. Hey, no, Chris Rock. Um, but uh, I never talked to Chris. I talked to his brother, Tony, who was also a really good comedian. Uh, um, and he just was quiet, man. He just was doing the work. He directed a few episodes. Um, it was great. Uh, and, I mean, I spoke to other comics like J.B. Smoove. It was a great comic. Uh, he was on uh, shows like Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David, uh, Tony Rock. Like I said, I spoke with him. Um, it was just, it, it, he was really good. And uh, aside from uh, Eddie Murphy, like I said, a lot of uh, every, Eddie Murphy, Dave Chappelle, and Chris Rock, they all, and Damon Wayans, I'll put that in because he's like another one of my idols. They all, uh, we are all the roots from one tree, which is pretty much Richard Pryor. Because from Richard Pryor, we all stem from that. And then we all just grew the branches from there. And we just kept doing what he was doing, which is to be vulnerable, to be real, um, to be apologetic, unapologetic, unapologetically yourself, whether it be black, white, you know, Hispanic, whatever. Just be real and truthful to the people when you're talking to them. And uh, that was the that's the main dude that who everybody just aspires to be and who people take from as far as not steal their jokes, but just steal from as far as style. I'm sure people stole the jokes. I'm sure I've stole his jokes, but I'm just saying he, he's just the, he's just the godfather. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just a pleasure. It was just an honor to be around them and to take from them and pick their brains and. And it'd be an honor just to watch them work when I was coming up. So, yeah. 
It's funny you talk about Damon Wayans because that is one of the guys that tends to sort of get lost a little bit, right? Because he did My Wife and Kids. Some people think of him from that show. He's got like a million brothers and sisters. Sometimes people like, <laughs> Damon Wayans, like he was funny as shit. And he's been on a lot of stuff, but it's just, I know with his health issues, he does a lot less now. But mm -hmm. even when he was doing um, uh, Lethal Weapon, like he was still, you know, still Damon Wayans. Not quite as, you know, but uh, still one of the guys that I feel like tends to get lost a little bit with everything that goes on. Yeah, no, Damon Wayans is, I think, I, 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 Highly, highly appreciate you saying that. Uh, I think he's under underappreciated, underrated. Because to me, I uh, the first time I saw Damian Wayans, well, I saw him a few times. It was, it was a half hour comedy special. I was like 13, 14. And then I was like, who is who the fuck is this guy? Oh my God. Because he was on this thing called Robert Townsend Partners in Crime, which was on HBO. And he would come out, they would do 10, 15 minutes, and they gave me a half hour. Then they did his. Then he was on in living color with his brothers, and which you know took sketch comedy to another level. And then he did this one com uh, stand up comedy called My Last Stand, which was shot at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. I believe it was 1988, 89. And it, it, it was one of the best stand ups I've seen. I mean, it just from transitions to him doing voices and characters, but again. He talked about Richard, he loved Richard, but he just took it to another level and he did what Richard would have done, which is create a story and not be afraid and just really push the envelope. See, people see him off my wife and kids, but you got you had to see him stand up, man. Oh, he was amazing. And those were the, and that, that's the kind of comedy that I gravitated to, just physical comedy, telling stories, jokes, um, just really having people, just taking people on that journey. But yeah, Damon Wayans, um, along with his brother, big brother Keenan Ivory Wayans, they changed the game, you know. And then Sean and Marlon, they just took it and ran with it. Like you said, they got—I don't know—I think they just had another baby while we're talking right now. They had like <laughs> fucking twenty-five kids, but but they—they, they, hey man, they—they're they're the royal black family of Hollywood, man. I'm telling you, of comedy, they're just amazing. That's got to be it. When you grow up with that many siblings and all of them are talented, like it's either going to push you because you're a competitive person and you're going to, you know, I want to beat everyone, which I don't know how you're going to do that because there's always a new competitor, like we mentioned. Yeah. But, you know, that's either going to elevate you or it's going to bury you. And somehow it just elevated everybody. And that's that says a lot about them that it was, you know, no one really got lost in the shuffle. Agreed. And they, they I think they mentioned something like that where people, they would be at the dinner table and it would say who can make their father laugh, I believe. And they were just doing bits and imitating and and like joking like ripping on each other jonesing on each other and everything everybody we laughing and who could spit make them milk spit out their nose or something but it was just like you said it was a competition but it was a friendly competition it wasn't any malice in it and i think that was the great thing about it and uh yeah i mean even kim wins i i miss i saw kim wins and i was like oh shit i remember kim damn where you been girl you know i just like old friends but it was just, uh, I think Keenan opened the door for them and they obliged and they never, they haven't stopped, man. They haven't stopped. I mean, that's, like I said, that's the royal family of comedy right there. So you, you mentioned Bernie Mac earlier and the big thing about, there's, for some reason, there's people still discovering him in his comedy and they're like, oh my God, that couldn't, you know, he couldn't say that today. Like, you know, the way he's screaming at people and using all these yeah. colorful words that people are yeah. scared of, like. What does that tell you about comedy today for you as a comedian? Like the fact that it seems like today people have to be more careful while back then you'd see like guy, guys like Bernie Mac where they just didn't give a fuck as long as it was funny. I think personally, and I've said this before, I think it should still be that way. I um, Dave Chappelle had said this in one of his stand-up special. He said, he, uh, or I think he was receiving an award. He was receiving either the Mark Twain Award or it was a special, I forget. But he said he's going to defend comedy to its the right to say what you want to say on stage uh, because that's what art is. Some people are going to like it. When you go to a, a museum, you'll see, three people could be looking at a painting. One person would be like, oh, it's pretty good. Other person would be like, this is shit. And the other person would be like, this is amazing. That's what comedy is. You're either going to say, eh, okay. Uh, one other person going to be like, he's an asshole. Or the other person would be like, he's amazing. You, what you want, don't want is someone do, to be indifferent, where they just have no opinion. That means your art isn't touching anybody. And I think that we have come to a spot where we are now taking away the one. Now, I'm not saying free speech 
is, I mean, there is free speech, but you aren't free from consequences. So I'm, I'm saying that also. You have to be, every comic knows when they've crossed the line. I don't give a fuck what they say, but every comic knows when they have crossed that line. When they, for me, it's like, I won't talk, talk about like, you know, you know, uh, like I, I, like raping babies or something like that or something like that. Like that's just too much for me. I'm like, there's nothing funny in that. But if there's a way I could skew it where I could kind of manipulate it in a way where it's clever and it pokes people like, oh my God, I can't believe he went that way. Because it's an, it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any malice behind it is what I'm trying to say. And I think what people are trying to do is be the moral police. You can't be the moral police in everybody's life, you know? You can't tell people what to say, how to say, but what they're trying to say is, I want you to feel how I'm feeling. And not everybody's gonna feel how you're feeling. Because our job is not only to make you laugh, but hopefully make you think. And if we can't make you think, just make you laugh to forget about your problems. Now, now why you, not because you're pissed off, now you're gonna put your shit on us. Like we had something to do with it. I'm like, I had nothing to do with it. I mean, I, I'm just trying to do my job, bitch. What's wrong with you, shit? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, uh, it's a slippery slope when you try to censor folks when they're trying to do their jobs. Like I said, I don't, like, for example, I think this one comic said something regarding Kobe's death when he died. Yeah. I, and it was just like right after. And they were like, dude, really? And it was with his daughter. And it was like, come on, man. And every every comic jumped on him like, no, no, that's not cool. See what I'm saying? So we know. When it's crossed the line, like when if there's a death with someone's daughter or family, no, I leave that alone. But I do like to fuck with the higher ups, like people, like rich people or you know corporate folk, because those are the ones that feel like they're untouchable. And a lot of people feel that say that way too, like oh fuck them, they're not untouchable, they're just like us, you know. So it's um it's a thing where I feel we should fight for what we want to say, but. There's a good, there, there is a good place where sometimes for people that are in power, where it's good for them to put out because you need for them to behave, especially for the ones underneath them, because they have no power. So um, I, 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 as far as stand-up is concerned, I think Bernie Mac would still be funny as shit. I'd laugh at his ass. Oh, for sure. Oh, 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 I, oh, oh I think he'd still be, I think he'd crush it today. Um, I don't think he'd, be, he'd like the... Zoom shows because you can't put Bernie Mac on no damn Zoom show. Mother huck! <laughs> now they think Bernie, something wrong with Bernie. Maybe he's passing a stone or something. Uh, but I think comedy is in a good place right now because, hey, with all the shit that's happening to this, you know, today politics, social unrest, pandemic, family. I mean, dude, what, what do you want us to talk about? I was doing my laundry the other day. What the fuck is that? Come on, man. We don't want to hear about that. You want to be about the real. <laughs> exactly. You, you, I mean, have you worked with Bernie Mac? I believe you worked with him on, on his show before, right? Like, I, I believe you have a credit on there. Yeah, I did. I, I did the Bernie Mac show. Um, and he was amazing. He, he, that's another brother that uh, gave me some, I, I didn't even ask him questions. He just would drop these little gems. I just, I mean, he would just be like, I got something to say. And then we just talk and then we just sit around the circle like a, an African tribe, like we just sitting there, yes, talk some more. You know, we didn't care. We just heard what he had to say. And this is when this is, and, uh, and Bernie was a, a tremendous worker. He worked his ass off. At that time, he was doing the Bernie Mac show, I think Ocean's 13, and Mr., um, I forgot what it's called, Mr. Baseball. It was a baseball movie, but. And I know I think, what you're talking about, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. But he was, he was working his ass off, but. I did do that show, uh, and again, it's always a shady character. I was the uh, cousin that, that stole shit from <laughs> that stole shit from around the house. I don't know why, man. Maybe I got that face, like I just steal shit. <laughs> but it was a shady character because I like, I, I think my line was because uh, I was we had a family reunion, and then Bernie, and then I, and then they hit all the the cards and the dominoes, and then I just happened to have the card. Like, where'd you find them damn cards? I was like, under the sink, and they loved it. And they were like, oh. He looked like he was lying already. And then they just casted me. And again, that was supposed to be just one scene. And then uh, fortunately, it lasted for three seasons. 
So do you run a risk a little bit when you play? Of course, I didn't mean that, you know, like you play like a risky or something like that. But is there like that risk that they sort of always put you in that kind of character? Like you're always going to be selling stuff from a car, you know, just in different cities on different shows. Like, <laughs> is there is there something like that you have to watch out for a little bit? Well, I hope not, man. I mean, it was, I, I really don't. They're like, oh, we need a motherfucker to sell shit. Mike, get him. Yeah, he's a, he know what to do. Mike, so is it? Do you hold it like this or like this, brother? I mean, how do you do it? Do you do the shoulder shimmy or do you just like just lay back? No, nah, I just it's just when the role comes, man. Hopefully, you talk about being typecasted. I hope not. Uh, I don't think I'm typecasted. I mean, comedy wise is my 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 little conduit, my little highway to get to do what I need to do. Um, but whatever role comes comes, man. It's about the work. It's about the journey, what I could bring to it, you know, and if I could make it real too, like you just said when I did that episode with Julius, it was not trying to go over the top, it's just, and it's, it sounds cliche, but like living in the moment, you just live in the moment, you know, and not let it get, you live in the live in the moment, don't let the moment overwhelm you, that's all, you know, just, just live there and just, and just ride that wave, so nah, I don't, I don't even think about that, I, I just live in the moment. So there's there's a lot of comedians. I know the big thing a lot of guys hate doing is when they have to like promote whenever they have a show or something. And they do these local radio shows where guys are finding out who you are as they're reading your name off the the paper and stuff. Is that something that you've had to do a lot? No, I have. Now that I'm on Netflix's show, The Upshaws, which yeah. is uh, airing, so it's been a little more. And um, honestly, uh, maybe because like I said, I'm not uh, too famous where I can't go out outside of my house. And I'm not too unknown where people won't recognize me. I'm in the middle. So at this point, I'm enjoying it. So anything I could do with whether it be this podcast or another show to promote myself or the show that I'm on, uh, I'm 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 cool with it. I love it. Uh it's just another like I said, I feel like Malcolm X where I was silenced for 90 days because all I was able to do was talk to my kids and they don't want to hear shit I have to say. They don't even know this. I'm like, hey guys, where you going? Don't you wanna? Okay, all right. Fuck you too. All right, and I just keep it moving. So it's it's great to just talk about the art, about what I'm doing, um, and just to get back to work again. So yeah, I have to do things like this, but it comes with the territory, man. You know this, you, like you like you know you reached out reached out to me. You just got to keep yourself relevant and keep yourself uh, creatively stimulated. So that's what I look at. That's how I look at it. Have you had, have you done some where you're in the middle of it and hopefully not this one, but where you're sitting there thinking like, you know, I got to, you know, we got to wrap this up, man. We got to stop this shit. Like, or even the questions where it's like, are we going to talk about everybody hates crystal the whole entire time? Or are we going to talk about the thing I'm trying to promote? Like, I assume that that would be a little bit of the difficulty too. Well, I mean, it depends on, I mean, I guess, I guess I can't really answer that, uh, honest, because I'm in a good mood. So maybe if I was in a bad mood, I'd be like, man, what the fuck? Look, the show is over, damn it, Lucas. Shit. <laughs> let's talk about the upshots. Damn. I mean, let's stop living the past. No, so I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a great, I'm in a good place right now. Like I said, I'm just more appreciative that people are reaching out to me, such as yourself and other podcasts or shows, to uh, actually sit down and, and have a conversation with me. And to talk about what I've done and how do you feel. And, and it's good, man. For me, it's like therapy, you know, aside from stand-up. Stand-up is like my therapy. So, and the, doing these things are like therapy. So when I'm talking in my stream of consciousness, I'm like, damn, I never knew I felt like, hey, shit, you know. So it kind of rings a bell. And hopefully what I say here can motivate or touch someone's soul or they can uh, relate to what I'm saying. Uh, like I said, it's just, I'm all, I'm, and I'll keep saying it, just appreciating that I'm in this position because a lot of my peers aren't, they, they're still struggling or trying to get their first break or trying to get a, a representation. So I'm grateful. All right, so let's talk about the upshots a little bit since you subtly, you know, right. Yeah, well, see, I, did that. <laughs> ah. I see that. Yeah, I see you, brother. Okay. So you, so you, I believe the show got uh, renewed for a second season, but tell me like, how did that kind of come together? Cause there are some big names attached to that show. And obviously, you know, Netflix being the big one. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, it's so funny. I didn't even know it was going to be on Netflix. I thought it was just, I was like, oh, it's going to be on like Tubi or Quibi or some shit like that. I didn't know. And yeah. then I, I just went in uh, the first time I read um, 
got a call back uh, after the first initial inter- audition. And then when I walked in, I know Mike Epps and Wanda Sykes. I used to, when I was uh, doing comedy, when I, before I hit double digits with comedy, they were already out in New York. And Mike was like, what's up, Mike? I was like, oh, I was like, hey, oh, damn. And then Wanda was like, hi, Mike. I was like, oh. I, and it kind of almost threw me off my game because you could approach it in one way, like you said, you know, pressure bus pipe sometimes. And I was like, oh, my God, now I really have to really push out and really do good and, blah, and then all of a sudden get all choreographed. But it, it actually just relaxed me. It relaxed me. I was like, oh, that's my people. And I did it, and they're like, all right, good job, Mike. And then, lo and behold, I, 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 after the callback, they said, hey, Mike, they want to give you an offer. And then I, at first I was like, offer for what? I didn't even know what the hell they were talking about. Yeah. Because your mind is, you know, you're, you're, doing, you're on to the next thing. Because I've trained my mind where I'm not going to start relying on one thing, or as they say, put your eggs in one basket. Because when you do that, you know, you're going to have – you're going to have a few cracked eggs up in there. It's going to be all yolky up in there. So you want to make sure that you disperse that shit. And you want to make sure that you are able to move on to the next thing. So when that blessing, that opportunity does come, you are in a place where you are not so desperate, but you're always staying active. And I was staying active. And when I got it, I was pumped. And then the only time I found out it was Netflix was when I was driving onto the lot. I saw this big ass Netflix. I was like, Oh, hey, Netflix. Hey, that's great. And Netflix. Then I go into the set like, oh, damn, they really like Netflix around here, don't they? Wow, this is something, man. It's like, and then all of a sudden, they go, yeah, hey, that's the guy charged the president of development of Netflix. Like, oh, shit, this is on Netflix. Oh, damn. And that's when I started, like, almost getting palpitations and sweaty hands. And I was like, okay. And I started, like, really jumping. Like, Calm down, brother. Don't worry about it. You got the job. So we hired you for a reason. And then from that point on, it was smooth sailing. But Mike was great. Wanda was great. Uh, Regina Hicks, showrunner, she's awesome. Um, and the writing was great. So it, I didn't really, I just need to bring me and then bring a little bit more if, if called upon. So I just had to stay ready. And that's how I went on. If they had told you that your character was stealing shit or selling stuff out of the truck, yeah. or would you, would you have been like, you know, damn it, not this time? Or would you have found a way to make that work? Well, I, I mean, yeah, I was like, I have to make it work. But I was like, God damn, why am I stealing some shit? I'm like, does a black man always got to steal some shit? Okay, why the brother got to always, steal? oh, and I'm stealing from another black man? It's some bullshit right now. <laughs> now I'm a, so you're saying I'm the reason my community is going on the downside. Is that what you're trying to say? Because I can't keep my hands off shit? Uh, nah, man, it was it was cool. And it was, it, it was it, it's a different character. Um, it's a character that's actually like, uh, if I give a little backdrop of Tony, sweet guy, really wants to help uh, um, his boy out, but you know he still has some issues at the house. He's still kind of what we call a pussy whip uh, at the house, so he's trying not to uh, try to let that out. But he really is, and he's trying to still live the single life without actually being single. But he is uh, he's a really good guy, really uh, someone that's pushing uh, for his boss to uh, with his lady to really make things work because he wants to make if they if they fall apart then his relationship falls apart that's how he looks at it so he wants to make sure that they're you know that they're uh, doing that they're uh, make sure that the relationship is tight just for his own person because he's t- he's a little selfish yeah. So something I'm curious about, like, it seems like fans always have good things to say about you, right? Like some people, it's like, oh, I met Mike once outside of blah, 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 and he's an asshole. But it seems like people, people like they have good stories about meeting you. How do you feel like when you have fans come up to you? Like, are you sitting there thinking like, oh, shit, how am I acting? Or is it just, hey, whatever happens, happens. You're meeting Mike. Well, uh, give it time, Lucas. Someone's going to think I'm an asshole. Don't worry about it. It'll come over the Twitter feed. Don't worry about it. I'm going to be on an IG post. What a dick. And like, I was like... I, Alfred, I said, hello, and he said, fuck you. And I'm like, what? No, I said, no, I didn't. Uh, but he, um, no, I just I just be myself, man. I'm just, like I said, I'm appreciative. Uh, I just say, hello, how are you doing? Now, of course, if I'm with my family, and like, man, I can't believe, woo! Remember that M1 episode? I'm like, hey, look here, bro. I tried to be as cordial as possible. I'm like, hey, man, I'll get to you. Can I just finish ordering my food or, you know, 
you know, do just spending some time with my kids or my lady. Um, and that's all. Just be respectful. And that's pretty much it. So as long as you as long as you're respectful, I'm respectful. But if you're disrespectful, then I'll be disrespectful. That's how I look at it. Have you ever had like a crazy interaction with a fan where you think like if I don't get out of here, like you know, they're gonna rip my skin off or something crazy is gonna I'm gonna be locked in someone's basement? Like, have you had that kind of interaction yet? No, but I hope so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I am hope it is my son. Hey, everyone, you say hi, people, man. You, are you good? You want to say hi? This is my son. This is right here. It's my boy right here. This is Quentin. We live on the air right now. This is Lucas. I'm on a podcast right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, he's, that's my oldest boy. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's actually going to high school. He's graduating full ride to high school. By the by the way, I can't. Obviously. College. I mean, I'm even high school full ride from college. I'm oh, my bad. I saw. I'm trying to keep my high school, but yeah, you get a full ride to college. I didn't get a full ride last time. I got a full ride. I ended up with a daughter, but uh, it's not, uh, not, not quite the same. Not quite the same. No, it's not quite the same results that I wanted. But it's we're proud of them. We're proud of them. But um, but to get back to your original question, nah, man, no, nah, no, no tearing off of the clothes. No, oh my God, chasing me down the street. But oh my God, fingers crossed. One day, man. Oh. I'll be like passing Lucas's window. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Can't talk now, Lucas. They coming. They coming. You know. And then, so, uh, but hey, if it happened to happen, man, that's just a perk. That's just that. Uh, that's just you know icing on the cake. That's and that's not really. Before I used to think, oh man, I can't wait till that happens. Honestly, but at the end of the day, it's it's not really needed because you don't get into business for that. If you get into the business for that, then you you in it for the wrong reasons. You know what I'm saying? The reasons I like doing it is because, like what you said, you know, watching the show, I love the show. Or when people say it connects with me, or uh, you know, with the Upshaws, oh man, I got a friend like that. That shit is fun, you know, things like that. That's what really um, is important to me. That my art connects, or my stand-up connects with folks. You know, that's the thing that really shows what you're doing is meaning and it has value. And like it goes back again, you just want to make sure and show and want to be appreciated and give appreciation back to the folks that are showing you love. And that's why, like you said, when I meet folks, I'm just like, hey, man, I, I know what it's like because it's hard. It's ha- hard out in these Hollywood streets, man. It is hard, bro. I mean, because not to be, you know, um, Appreciated or value for your work is is difficult to a difficult pill to swallow. So when it does happen, you just really embrace it. So when, when people see you out on the street, are you more commonly called Mike or are they calling you Risky? I feel like Risky would be the big one because you had your own theme song and everything. Like do you yes. call Risky a lot when they see you? Uh one dude always does that. He knows my name. He's like Risky. I'm like, okay, man, look. Can we, can we coach this soccer game right now? Come oh. on, man. <laughs> Yeah. It's not the time to do it. We're down five nothing. We don't need to do all that. Man, it's over. five nothing. It's over. Like you oh, might, as well, might, might as well go be risky and sell oh, some yeah, whistles or something. Like yeah, that. Man, I'm a fighter. I don't know about you, Lucas, but I'm a fighter. Okay, we still have time. We still got the second half to play right now. Okay. Oh, it's down five. Oh, I'm five in the first half. Yeah, yeah. Oh, down, no. Hey, oh no. It happens. You know what happens in these youth leagues? It happens like that, man. They go. Sometimes the kid forgets where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be in the back, but he ends up in the front and. Uh, I'm like you're the midfielder. Why the hell are you way back here? You know, it's just it just go crazy. The strikers all out of position. But anyway, um, but no, I've had people do that, and the people just you know, what's up, Mike? You know, my, of course, my peers that have known me long enough, they call me Mike, and they're really um, we're just real, real with each other. That's all I ask for you to be is just real. Because I think the thing about it is that if you're genuine as a person, not always putting on airs, thinking that you are a quote unquote star, then people won't treat you as such. You know what I'm saying? But if you are on trying to put on this, then they'll feel like they can't approach you. And that's when you get the, oh, he just seems like an asshole or this person is a jackass. Just just be cool. But if I'm coming in with a glitter jacket, you know, and you know, you know, thug life living on my forehead and got like twirly shit around my hat and like with a glitter glove, I'm like, uh, okay, uh Cool, man. Like, <laughs> how you doing, baby? Call, talk to you later. I have, a, I have shades inside of a dark restaurant. Come on, man. Unless you have a seeing eye dog and a cane, take the fucking shades off. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
There we go. That's a it's a very important message for the sunglasses inside people. Like, yeah, I don't I really don't know even I mean, except for the blind people, like you mentioned, but anyone yeah. that can pull that one off, truly. Yeah, you can't pull that one off. I, I don't understand. The lights are not that bright. It's a dimly lit restaurant. And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, let's see what you have on your menu. Oh God, it's, I can't read it. Yeah, motherfucker, take the shades off. That's why. If you don't try putting a candle on it and you burn the menu up, it's just a whole other level of ridiculousness. So I just like uh, it just goes back to being genuine, just being genuine, just being yourself, being real. So before we wrap this up, a lot of people that tend to watch this podcast are like UFC fans. We had a big moment this past weekend. Did, yeah. did you see any that went on? Conor McGregor, oh, yeah. big leg break. Were you following that one? Oh, I uh, I followed it. I followed it all the way. I mean, most people after they saw it one time, but I'm I, I guess I, I I don't know what happened in my childhood where I like to see things like that. But I, I was like, first it's his ankle. I was like, wait, that's not his ankle. That's his shin. And they're like, is it shin ankle? I mean, I've never seen something like that. Um, now, they were saying that it was a uh, uh, that Poirier had checked his kick, which is like uh, uh, that contributed to him breaking the ankle. Because he's because I've never seen because he looked like he just misstepped his because he was rocking back to shoot. Uh, I think it was left. Yeah, he's South Park. So he's rocking back to shoot a left, and then he just landed on the back of his foot, and then all the weight came down. So I, I was, I was like, oh, first of all, I was happy that I didn't pay for it because I went over my my kid, my friend's house. So I was like, cool. There you go. That's that's the smart move. Right? That's what we went to a party. He's like, I'll pay for it. I'm like, hey, I'm there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Say yeah. important things. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So there was a silver lining for me. I don't know for Connor, but. Um, yeah, I saw it, man. I was I was shocked, but I think I, really, if it didn't break, I think Poirier would have won anyway. I think Poirier was uh, ground and pounding him to death. I mean, Connor got some good elbows in. I don't know why he tried to do the guillotine because I never knew Connor to try to do a fucking exactly. Choke. exactly. Yeah, I was like Connor, that's not you. And then Poirier was like, "Oh, I know what to do," because Poirier is about grappling. Because remember, he fought Habib, and I think he learned something from that. And I heard people talk about this and. And, I'm, and I started to think about this too. I don't think Connor's evolved as a fighter. Ever since Mayweather, I think he's not really added anything to his game. Like you look at Usman and Ganu and Lewis, even Derek Lewis and all these uh, Mewages, they've evolved. You see, oh, okay, I never saw so like in Ganu. Remember when he the guy tried to take him down? He, he dropped his hips down so he wouldn't get wrestled. That's how he won the championship because the last time he got taken down like that. So. For Connor, I mean, he tried doing some kicks. I don't know why, but you know, he tried something. But it just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem, it doesn't look good for Connor. That's what I have to say. Think. So, so you're a comedian. You mentioned Derek Lewis. Everybody in MMA thinks funniest man alive. Great Instagram and stuff. But you're funny professionally. People pay you to be funny. What do you think of Derek Lewis? Putting you right here on the spot. Controversy, all that good stuff. I think Derek Lewis is hilarious. I think that fucking guy's hilarious. Now, I might not believe it. I'm not, I don't believe it is political views. Yeah, but, yeah that, was, that was a weird one coming from Derek Lewis. But. Yeah, Derek Lewis like, yo, my man, you know, y'all got to leave my man Trump. I'm like, your man Trump? What? What the fuck <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, I thought I was being, I, I thought I listened to, I, I, there was something kind of dubbing. I thought we got bombed or something with the dubbing. But no, he was like that. Him and Masvidal, same guys. Now, I have learned to separate the fighter from his views. He's a really exciting fighter. Can be really funny. Uh, but I just leave the views alone. You know what I'm saying? I just like, okay, I'm just watching the fight. Now, Kobe Covington, I want that motherfucker's ass to be free. I don't know. His ass, I can't stand. I can't yeah. use mine to shut him up, get him out. I mean, he's a good fighter. To me, he's a good fighter, not a great fighter. He's a good fighter, not a great fighter. Uh, but Lewis and all them, I mean, he's funny. He's funny. Like I said, political views aside, I'm like, whatever, dude. I don't know. Uh, like, to quote Joe Biden, if you're black, how you go over Trump? But that's just me. I mean, that's, I just, I, that's just me. Um, but Derek Lewis, I think, is a funny dude. I think he's a hell of a fighter. I can't wait to see his fight. I think it's coming up in August. It's August 3rd. He's fighting somebody. For, uh, yeah, Cyril Gann, the Frenchman. So, yep. Yeah, he's, and, got, and get, yeah, well, this is going to be a great fight. That's and you talk about two different styles with, and two different body styles. I mean, one looks like a damn Adonis, and one looks like a donut. 
Uh, there you go. Know, it's the Popeye <laughs> body by Popeye. Yeah, exactly. You know, Popeyes versus you know L.A. Fitness or something. That's what it looks like, bro. But it's going to be hell. And Derek Lewis, he's, he's going to give him everything he can handle. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see. It's going to be interesting to. But these guys, hey, uh, these uh, these fighters, uh, I recently, I think a few years back, have really gotten into the MMA scene. I was just a huge boxing fan, and I really didn't understand the. Uh, technique of any MMA. I liked the striking. I knew the boxing aspect of it, but the grappling and the holding, I was like, first of all, why do I want guys nuts in my ear? And yeah. Yeah. I'm like, uh, it's just, it's just too much. And then he's, you know, he's got the trying, he's like wrapping his legs around his hip. I'm like, Hey man, he's fucking, he's fucking in the ring. Yeah. What's going on over there? But then I realized there's a strategy. And, and when you hear like guys like Bisping and, you know, Rogan and, and uh, Cormier talk and really talk you through it, Oh, okay, makes sense, and you have a better appreciation for it. So, um, but yeah, man, it's 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 funny, man. And some of those guys could be comedians, especially that one dude that drinks out of a shoe. The, oh, uh, Tai Tai Tuivasa, yeah, I, dude, that shit had me rolling. I was like, well, fuck COVID. You better check him for athletes foot in his throat. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I'm still here. It's a, it's a, yeah. That's the the fun of uh. Yeah, oh. you know, so. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. I like I I felt like it was a uh, like a, a prepaid p- a pay card like okay yeah you're done Mike sorry yeah. we said an hour and you've gone over your limit yeah it's like you know I started playing the music and I was like wrap it up Mike we <laughs> get it they drank from the yeah. shoe like we so we all saw it man yeah, exactly okay we get it we got, we got pay per view Mike yeah. Uh, I saw I saw a doctor put on Twitter. He was like, "Here's why it's nasty to drink out of a shoe." And he's like, "You ever notice they smell bad?" I was like, "Don't do that." I was like, "Don't ruin shoes." Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Look, no. yeah, let the man have his moment. All right, yeah, come on, you man. Know? Like, we're having fun. We're enjoying it. He's drinking yeah, from yeah. a shoe. He's Australian. He's Australian. Look, that's what they do in Australia. I guess they drink out of shoes. I mean, shit. You know, all the all the kangaroos they can't drink out of their pouches. They get violent. So uh, it's good. And plus, he knocked out Greg Hardy, which I can't stand that anyway. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I don't like his ass anyway. So. It, it was it was a good night, but uh, yeah, man. I think uh, to, in summation, I think Connor's pretty much done. I think it, it's it's a wrap for him. I don't think he should fight Poirier. Um, I think it's. I mean, just just sell your your spirit whiskey, whatever the hell it is, and just call it a day. After you know, you you got three something million in the bank. Just enjoy your life. Well, there we go. That's a great way to wrap it up. I'm not Joe Rogan, so I'm not going to keep you for another three hours while everybody needs to piss. <laughs> Somehow you, you tough through it. I don't know how they do that. But listen, yeah. man, I'd like to end by letting guys plug, you know, your social media. If you have anything coming up, projects, this will be the time to plug everything. Sure. Uh, Mike Estimate, thank you again. Lucas, appreciate you guys. Uh, it is uh, my Twitter is at M-E-S-T-I-M as in Mary E. That's at M as in Mary E-S-T-I-M-E 42. Or you can get me on Instagram at Mike Estime Comic, M-I-K-E-E-S-T-I-M-E, Comic, C-O-M-I-C. So hit me on those two, and I put on pictures of my dates where I'll be performing and when uh, hopefully I'll be on set. And again, check out The Upshaw, season two on Netflix. Thanks again. All right, there we go. For the people that made it to the end, thank you so much. Mike, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Now, we'll